come away with anything but a vivid impression. She was full of life and energy and always ideas. Um, just an amazing person who heard about the things that she started here at GMT. It was a very uh, live time for linguistics with um, the, at GMT. And I think this, the evidence of how just how lively it was is how we were. Um, the, the influence of the linguistics department, the social linguistics revolution was happening a lot. A lot of it happened in the years 10 with people like Lubov and Kalhai, Urban Goff. Thank you. 
practice multilingualism and ethnographic research. A prolific author and editor, many of whose books and articles find their way onto our course syllabuses. Angela is also a prolific PI and leader of research teams. She's been awarded several substantial research grants over the past decade or so, including four from the UK's Economic and Social Research Council, a very prestigious funding body and a research body. And just recently won a new award from the Arts and Humanities Council, a large grant program for a four-year research project. It's called Translation and Translanguaging, Investigating Linguistic and Cultural Transformations in Superdiverse Wards in Four UK Cities, a collaborative and interdisciplinary project that involves colleagues at Birmingham, but also uh, Cardiff, Leeds, and London, and also includes non-academic partners like the Migrants' Rights Network, the Museums Trust, the Law Center's Network. So I think we have Thing, the good thing to look forward to out of that project. One of the very special things about Angela is her ability to participate in conversations on both sides of the Atlantic around linguistics, anthropology, and education because of her deep engagement with both the UK and the US scholarly traditions in those fields. It was something that I remember worried her a little bit when she first went back to Britain after finishing her PhD and, and having been here for several years, um, but she turned that challenge into a great strength of her scholarship and it's been really to everyone's benefit. Also special about Angela are her skills in research collaborations and leading those collaborations with a gentle, mature <coughs> The work that um, she did with colleagues most recently on multilingualism in complementary schools in the UK, which I think we may hear a little bit about today. Um, reported in several journal articles and in her co-authored book with her research and life partner, Adrian Blackledge. The book is entitled Multilingualism, and uh, my students in language diversity are reading it this week, as a matter of fact. Um, it's, it's really a field-shaping book, and I had the chance to preview a new book, an edited volume by the same by Kate and Angela and Adrian, called Heteroglossia. Jesse Rhymes has a chapter, correct? <laughs> if I remember correctly. Um, and it's, it's going to be another field shaping book, so um, it just keeps coming from Angela. I've been also lucky to work with Angela more closely in the last five years as she served with me on the editorial team for the Anthropology and Education Quarterly. Um, and that has been to give the Nessa Walson Colloquium Lecture 2013. With warm thanks to the Walson family and to the Educational Linguistics Division for inviting me and your generosity in supporting the visit. Thank you to Crystal Smalls for her painstaking attention to detail and Bridget Goodman for waiting a long time at the airport uh -oh. for me yesterday. <laughs> for me, it's quite a homecoming. As Nancy says, I was a ed linguistics student in 1989 when I took classes with Nessa Wolfson, Terry Peeker, Nancy Hornberger, Kathy Doughty, Fred Erickson, and also in anthropology, John Lucy. It is no exaggeration to say that each of these teachers and their knowledge continue to serve as models of scholarship for me. 
I have saved my teaching notes and bulk packs from each of their classes, and 15 years after graduation, I often look at these notes for references and clarification. I am a very proud graduate of this programme and the engaged scholarship it represents. To be an international student at Penn in the early 19, uh, 18, sorry, 1990s, not 1890s, <laughs> was wonderful, and I expect it still is. I learned very quickly that drawing on my own background was expected and desired. Coming to Philadelphia to study educational ling linguistics both freed me of the expectations of the British class system, but also simultaneously required me to engage with it. Indeed, it was at the heart of many of my assignments. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll come back to that one. <laughs> the first class I took with Nossa, Nessa Wolfson, the sociology of uh, language, saw me write a report on linguistic diversity in the UK. And I had to come to the US to want to write this paper. I needed the distance to think about things anew. I often contemplate this experience with my own international students at the University of Birmingham. My tutor's willingness back then helped me find my own voice, and I am deeply indebted forever and for always to Nessa, Terry, and Nancy as the three women who provided me with this confidence and insight. But my homecoming is, all where, is also filled with some trepidation. What might I say to a distinguished pen audience that could interest them? What can I possibly contribute? The experts are already here, their scholarship internationally renowned. A department steeped in Heimsian theory and methodology, seminal scholarship in multilingualism, biliteracy, language planning and policy, communicative repertoire, heteroglossia, and the linguistic anthropo anthropology of education. As the old expre English expression goes, I would be well advised to follow the advice, don't teach your grandmother to suck eggs. <laughs> with this in mind, it is some, with some nervousness that I try out a new analysis here today. The work is new in the sense that I use this occasion, which honours Nessa Wolfson's research, life and teaching, to return to some of the ideas that I first learned in her class. For the next hour or so, I return to the speech act as a unit of analysis. In particular, I look at bilingual speech acts, which see participants in our research complement, persuade and disagree with one another. I return to questions first asked in Nessa Wolfson's classroom about the pedagogic relevance of this work. I find myself second-guessing what Nessa Wolfson might herself say about the developments in social pragmatics, politeness, face and intercultural interaction. So my presentation is divided into four main areas. I start with some reflections on my days as a student at Penn describing the connections made between research and teaching we were encouraged to seek. I reflect on an early essay I wrote about teaching communicative competence through the teaching of speech acts. Second, I set the scene for the research I've been doing over the last 10 years on multilingual practices in complementary schools. And complementary schools are also known as heritage language schools, supplementary schools, community language schools. And I'll come back to that later. Third, I return to speech acts and social pragmatic scholarships to interpret multilingual data. I apply a speech act analysis of a mother and daughter interaction over several events. Fourth, I consider the relevance of this research to the classroom and the teaching of language. I return to the concept of appropriate language use to consider its pedagogic value in teacher education and argue for a heteroglossic theorising of communicative competence. Overall, I make the argument that the concept of appropriate language use retains its relevance in sociolinguistics and critical language pedagogy because it presupposes context as wider than the immediate and present. My reading of Himes' concept of appropriate language use adopts a view of language as a resource 
operating in contexts of multiple norms and multiple communities and understands that speech is never stable. Increasingly, scholars use terms such as repertoire and heteroglossia in preference to concepts such as languages or varieties with their notions of boundedness and purity. And I'm one of those academics. These arguments throw into disarray many of the terms we have taken as given in sociolinguistics. Language, variety, native speaker are some relevant to this talk. These developments, of course, have important implications for the study of multilingualism. As human agents, we all have access to different communicative signs, different registers, different accents, different genres, which are deployed in identity work and which others presuppose in identification. But we shouldn't forget, as Himes reminds us, these speech resources have different and uneven social value. In educational linguistics, we attempt to understand the social consequences of deploying these resources, especially the hierarchies, inequalities, and injustices which may result from their deployment. I start with some reflections which set the scene for the arguments I wish to make today. Nothing ages you like looking back at old teaching material. <laughs> While I was a grad student at the, uh, in the Educational Linguistic Programme, I had a teaching fellowship from English language programmes where we used the book Speaking Naturally. As you can see, the book covered a number of different language functions and gave cultural rules of use. Teachers served as facilitators of what was appropriate or not. One example was the teaching of compliments. The rule given in the text was clear and unambiguous. You always accept the compliment, usually by saying thank you and providing some extra information. Oh, thanks, I got it from Sears, says Rolando. <laughs> Often, the nuances of context fell to the teacher to deal with. I was expected to provide benchmarks of appropriate language use. I was the one with the communicative competence representing a speech community and its practices. And that wasn't always easy. First of all, I was a newly arrived British national and I was aware I didn't give compliments in the same way as some of my American friends and colleagues. I was also a young woman, white, with a particular set of experiences and not others. And I struggled with some of the appropriacy questions. For example, is it okay for David to say to Rolando, nice shirt? Or for Rolando to say to his teacher, me, nice blouse? Or for Angela, the grad student, to say to Nancy, her professor, some good teaching today, great job. <laughs> the myth of being a native speaker to a speech community called American English, able to answer all questions, was beginning to dawn on me. Luckily, at the same time as teaching ESL, I was also taking a class with Nessa Wolfson on intercultural competence and pragmatics and found out that compliments can be face-threatening acts and that for many, accepting a compliment was not the normal order of things, rather refusing a compliment was more comfortable and acceptable and that gender, status and age were also variables that mattered. It was all very interesting, and it was helpful to be able to apply some of this knowledge to my ESL class. Indeed, as mentioned earlier, we were encouraged to interrogate such teaching material for our class assignments, and I still have Nessa Wolfson's comments on an early paper I wrote in 1989. You'll see, if you read, first of all there's some typos in my bit, but we'll put that to one side. You'll see she doesn't 100% agree with my conclusions, that we should give the textbook writers a little slack. They can't cover all details of sociolinguistic rules, and she writes, but some of what they say is wrong and misleading. The real problem is that learners may suffer worse consequences from inappropriate sociolinguistic behaviour than from the misuse of the present tense. Textbook writers are responsible for knowing the research findings. Her argument is clear and passionate. Research should be informing practice. G. 
During this per period, Nessa gave me a precious gift. It was precious because it was the first time I had ever been given a book by one of my teachers. It showed her kindness and generosity. She was very ill at the time, but she still found time to encourage her students. It was generous because it was built by Del Hines, whose work she greatly believed in and admired. She passed on her knowledge and beliefs through this gift. Her encouragement and the dedication of this gift led directly to my first publication, which, as you can see, was in the <laughs> Penn's Working Papers. My paper compared, it's the second there, my paper compared one specific cultural context in the UK, a teacher's room, a teacher's staff room, in which participants used one variety of English, so-called British English, with a similar cultural context in the US, which saw teachers using another variety of English, American English. And um, I was particularly looking at the complement. From this, I attempted to identify similarities and differences that might point to a higher level of cultural generalisation. Looking back, I enjoyed this paper tremendously. Comparing British and American English always attracts attention on both sides of the Atlantic. But it's also interesting to chart my departure from many of the assumptions I made in this early paper. First, I made assumptions about varieties of language, that these could be labelled easily and unproblematically. I didn't question what I meant by British or American English. Second, because a priori I started collecting data in which the main focus was two varieties of English in two different national settings, I missed the opportunity to collect data beyond these categories, particularly multilingual data, because this wouldn't have fitted into the design. Third, I isolated one speech act from other speech acts and other ways, or all of the, the rest of the stuff around them. So mine, when I look back, mine was a monolingual framework where teachers, um, of teachers of multilingualism in these staff rooms would not have been counted as data. They would have been excluded. So when I look back, I find myself guilty of overgeneralizing, and my findings were rather essentialist. Brits do this, and Americans do that. With these criticisms in mind, I'd like to visit, to revisit the concept of the Speech Act to consider its analytical value in researching multilingual interactions. But first, let's remind ourselves of what Del Himes, um, how he defined the term. He says, a speech act represents a level distinct from the sentence and not identifiable with any single portion of other levels of grammar. To some extent, speech acts may be analysable in linguistics, but much of the knowledge that speakers share about the status of utterances as acts is immediate and ab abstract, and having to do with features of interaction and context <coughs> as well as uh, grammar. So the speech act is a social act, not linked with any one particular grammatical form. Speakers implement these acts through their social knowledge, knowledge which, as Delheim says, is both immediate and abstract. And I take abstract here to be knowledge beyond the context which speakers make use of in their interaction, even if they're not aware of it. Their ref the reference to both immediate and abstract is important here because it's about conceptualising context as beyond the present. This definition engages with the historical and the aspirational of the future context. And we'll come back to this to my, uh, later on in the talk. So history and the future and not just presentism. Which brings me to the first piece of data um, that I'd like to share. I, I'll, I'll say more about where this uh, data um, comes from uh, later on when I, when I talk a little bit about the... Um, the research projects that I've been doing. But for now, uh, just to say that um, this comes from the Punjabi Complementary School Classroom on a Saturday afternoon in Birmingham. The two speakers, Narinda and Hema, are both uh, teachers. 
Narinda has recently arrived from the Punjab. Um, she's working as Hema's assistant in the class, and, and Hema has uh, lived in the UK for around 15 years. The event happen the, the speech act, the compliment, happens just before um, class starts. So, so we'll listen to that. <laughs> I eye makeup karung na, fir ta lenses highlight ho. But nice color hai. Really? Then who highlighting chahiye thi? No, 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 no. I mean, no, I mean, I mean, to kuch notice hi nahi hota hai ki hai ka bhi, why bhi hai ya nahi. Pehli baar paaya na, dil aa gaya. Spelling paaye color, keda color paaye sir. Notice the brown, the light brown chhod raha hoon na. So, so it moves, it moves very quickly. But actually, uh, what happens there is Narinda gives Hema a compliment on the coloured contact lenses that she's um, wearing. So, um, a compliment is a speech act which explicitly or implicitly attributes credit to someone other than the speaker, usually the person addressed for some good. Um, it's an appearance compliment. It's a formulaic appearance compliment. Um, in the sense that it, it's a nice colour, fits the formula that Mainz and Wolfson um, identified in their 1981 data. The compliment response from Hema in, the, uh, in her first term there, where she says, really, uh, compliment response sequence is negotiated. She doesn't accept the compliment, she doesn't just say thanks, and she doesn't, um, she doesn't refuse it. She says, really, so it's not accepted um, or refused, but it leads to... Um, an extended interaction between Narinda and Hema. And this fits with Wolfson's Bulge theory, um, where status equals friends and co workers engage in care work um, being done to signal solidarity. Wolfson argued that friends and other acquaintances are most likely to get involved in long negotiations with multiple repetitions, and, and colour is talked about and highlighting is mentioned several times in the interaction. But Hemmer's really also points to an ambivalence about the compliment. One possible interpretation of this ambivalence is the face-threatening act of the compliment. Pomerantz, 1978, describes two conflicting norms in the complement response sequence. The normative pressure to show appreciation, which conflicts with the normative pressure to perform self-praise avoidance. <coughs> Emma wishes to downplay she is paying attention to her appearance. So what we see in this before class speech event is an example of a complement speech act being used to negotiate friendship, but which through its performance also evokes attention about appearance and perhaps stances on femininity. How much Hema is prepared to acknowledge the attention she pays to her appearance is at stake here and is expressed in really and nahi, which is repeated four times. The compliment appears as a face-threatening act. But perhaps the most obvious point that I haven't mentioned is the bilingual nature of the speech act. Hema and Narinda translanguage to accomplish this social act. They draw on a variety of different signs to perform the act of giving and receiving a compliment. For the speakers, it's not about one language or the other. They're drawing on their resources to, to build solidarity, to, to be nice to one another. It's a very typical example of language use in the community language classroom on a Saturday afternoon in Birmingham. It's bilingual, but for the speakers, the interaction is not about which language, it's about building solidarities and friendship. So what's the connection to the late 1980s ESL Philadelphia classroom that I mentioned earlier? Well, certainly when I was teaching ESL in the 1980s, it never occurred to me to refer to my students' bilingualism in the negotiation of speech acts. Even though my students, too, were emergent bilinguals, we had established a monolingual approach to teaching speech acts and culture. Even though these students would experience bilingualism as usual practice outside the ESL classroom, we did not think to find ways, I did not think to find ways, to make this bilingualism, this bilingual environment, normative in the classroom or to encourage it as an aspiration. 
The communicative competence we were striving to teach our students was predicated on understandings of purity and a social order which did not include multilingualism, bilingualism or understandings of communicative repertoire. There was too much attention to the code, not of the speaker or their practices. And I agree with Claire Cramps when she says, ultimately, multilingualism challenges the very goal of foreign language education in America, American academia, avowedly designed to teach usable skills in the supposedly monolingual environment of the target country and to enable American foreign language learners to perform supposedly universal communicative speech acts that will be understood and accepted by all because of their accurate grammar and pragmatics. And this brings me to um, the second part of my talk, which is to describe the research I've been doing over the last 10 years or so. As Nancy says, um, I've been lucky enough with my colleagues to, reserve, uh, to receive research um, funding uh, from the research councils. And uh, four of the projects are listed there. Um, if you go from the bottom, I'd, I'd particularly like to mention my colleague and friend, Peter Martin, who I worked closely with on those early projects and towards the, the top, uh, more recently, with, with Adrian uh, Blackledge. Um, and in today's talk, I am mostly going to be talking about the, the recent project um, in which you can see the four uh, collaborators there. Uh, Adrian Blackledge was the, um, was the PI, and I'd also like to uh, in particular mention Jasper Kortaki at the end, who worked with us in the, bilingual, uh, in the um, Birmingham um, case study. Also, just like to pause here um, to, uh, to thank um, Penn for also inviting uh, Adrian Blackledge to, to come along with me and give the talk today. Unfortunately, um, for domestic reasons, uh, he couldn't be here. Um, and I, he drew, oh well, he's, he's back home walking the dog. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry he couldn't be here, but he, he really would have very much liked to be here with me. So the work that I'm talking about is very much um, uh, a, uh, a collaborative uh, enterprise. So um, I'm talking, uh, the, the, the project, uh, the HERA project uh, that Adrian um, was the PI for, um, was a European project, but I'm only going to be talking about the, the last of the case studies there, the Punjabi uh, Complementary School. Our research aims um, across the research projects of, of, um, of, of shared um, some common objectives. Um, so I'll go through them here. The, the first is to investigate the range of language and literacy practices of multilingual young people and their teachers actually um, in uh, complementary schools in, across, oh, in the European settings um, to explore their cultural and social significance um, for the young people. The third aim um, is to investigate the language and literacy practices in terms of their identity performance and uh, how they're used to negotiate inheritance. The fourth aim, I want to just point out particularly, because although I'm not talking about that today, we've, we've really put a lot of um, attention and focus on thinking about what it means to, to do team ethnography, and in particular, multilingual team ethnography. What does it mean to research multilingualism multilingually? So we've written quite a lot about um, the processes of working in that kind of way. And the last is to think about the, uh, the implications um, of, of our work in terms of policy uh, and practice, including pedagogy. So complementary schools, as I've said, in the United States, I, I guess the most similar um, term is heritage language schools. They're outside of the state system. They don't receive money from uh, the state. They may s receive very small amounts of money from local government, but in times of austerity, that's been cut too. So they're community-run organizations. They're kind of bottom-up organizations. They're organized by community members. Um, they're voluntary. Obviously, uh, parents choose to send their, their children there. They, they don't have to, to go there. It's not uh, required. Um, the schools run their classes um, at the weekends and, and often after school. 
Um, and they vary hugely. They vary hugely in size. You can have around 30, 20 people on roll to over 300 students on roll. Um, and they also vary in their curriculum and focus. The schools that we've been looking at uh, provide community language classes, so we've been particularly interested in um, those which run uh, heritage language classes or community language classes. So just to give you a flavour, really, of what they look like, I'm just going to run through some photos very quickly. This is um, an assembly at uh, a Gujarati complementary school in Leicester, it's at the end of the session. You see the uh, teachers sitting on the side and at the back are the, are the parents. So that parents too are very much part of the assembly sessions. Um, Chinese complementary school in Manchester. Gujarati complementary school, Glistheimer classroom in Leicester. Turkish school in London. Uh, Bengali complementary school in Birmingham. Chinese, man, uh, uh, Mandarin in uh, Manchester, and a Punjabi complementary school in Birmingham. So ours, we would characterise our approach as a linguistic ethnography um, in which um, we, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you about the data in a moment. The, the school that we um, collected data in um, uh, a Punjabi complementary school, 220 students on roll, very young up until from 16 all the way, 6 to 16, 20 classes, uh, entry level um, up to A level, which is the qualification you need to enter uh, university, held on Saturdays across two sites. So we did what is typical of an ethnography, we collected a lot of field notes, we, we, took, we observed in the classes. Um, we also ask our key participants to wear lapel microphones and we audio record them in class but also increasingly out of class so that we have interactions um, in the home um, as mother and daughter, as you'll see in a minute, are, are in the car together brushing hair. So in, in other sites other than the classroom and uh, the other list of the kinds of data uh, that we collected are given there. So there are um, 12 uh, key participants in our study um, and today we're mostly uh, focusing on Parnit which is towards the uh, bottom four up from the, from the bottom there. You've already met, met Hema and Narinda um, who I started <coughs> the talk with in terms of their compliments. Um, and as I say, because we are audio recording um, our key participants, we pick up interactions with many other people that they are interacting with. And so we are going to hear from Parnit and um, her mother. Um, Parnit was born in Hertfordshire and moved to Birmingham at the age of 11. And she compares Hertfordshire to Birmingham in her interview data. And she says... I remember it was a really quiet area where we lived, and I have to say, because we were the only Indians there, me and my brother actually found we preferred it a lot more when we moved here because we really liked being surrounded by other Indians. Parnit's mother was born in the UK, but when she was 10 months old, she went to India with her family. The family stayed in India for seven years, at which point they returned at the insistence of her own mother. When the family returned to the UK, Parnit's mother was seven or eight years old. And although other members of the family have visited India since then, Parnit's mother has never returned. So the speech event uh, we're going to listen into is uh, Parnit and her mother driving along Soho Road, and they're on a shopping trip for Parnit to buy some new outfits. Um, these images don't come from our data, they're from the internet, and um, they're of Soho Road in Birmingham. Uh, there seems to be a Soho Road almost everywhere. Um, the Guardian um, described, The Guardian, which is a national uh, paper in the UK, uh, describes Soho Road as a two-mile thoroughfare where cultures, religions, and institutions collide seemingly at random. This is Soho Road. The array of religions and cultures is dizzying and undeniably thrilling. Okay, so um, <laughs> we'll see what uh, Pani thinks of that in a minute. 
Okay, so we're going to listen in. So as I say, Parneet and her mother have, uh, are in the car and they're driving along Soho Road. Where's my cursor going? Hmm. Oh, here it is. <coughs> and, uh, and they're chatting to one another. You need purple wood, but I like purple. Okay. Yes, yeah, kind of. Green, 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 green. I've got a lot of people, but I don't really like green. Interaction is about an, uh, uh, an outfit for Pani, which brings into play evaluations about colour, tone, material texture, and material patterns. So, using a speech act analysis, I'm characterising this as a mild disagreement. There's an expression of different views. I don't really like pink. In other words, Pani doesn't want pink or plain, but her mother would like pink and possibly plain. But from the onset, there is evidence that the interlocutors are working to minimalize the disagreement. With the mother's acha, is that right? She acknowledges and hears Parnit's objection. What we see here is concern from one another's face, which wouldn't be expected in a full-blown disagreement where the speaker conveys to the listener that they are wrong or misguided. Mother and daughter are looking after one another's positive face, the desire to be liked and approved, and negative face, the desire not to be imposed upon. So we might say that this mild disagreement is multi-directional because mother and daughter are involved in relationship work. They have an eye on the immediate, the present, but also on the future and their relationship. They're also drawing on the resources of past conversations. They've been shopping before. The speech act can also be described as multifunctional. As the event unwinds, we will see that there are signs of both conflict and affiliation. The mother translanguages to reinforce her arguments. Their repertoire involves using a range of resources for meaning making. Santon Wortham has, says, has said, socialization happens across many events. Pani and her mother's interaction directs and redirects itself in relation to wider discourses linked to the performances of femininities. Both mother and daughter are, as Wortham says, attending to the more widely circulating models or ideologies that provide a starting point for local interactional work. Pink is a circulating discourse representing voices associated with particular femininities. I don't really like pink allows Parnit to distance herself from these voices. However, her mother anticipates the objection and mitigates pink by introducing degrees of pinkness and texture. Oh, no, not, it's a different pink. <laughs> As the interaction continues, we see further nuances at play about clothing, which are used as semiotic resources in their ongoing relationship and identity work. I'm going to listen in again if the cursor comes up for me. So the disagreement continues, but there are attempts still at mitigation through hedging and persuasion. The thing is, Parnit. One thing the mother persuades, one way the mother persuades Parnit is through invoking the wider context. 
the mother mentions the Gudwara, and these become the voices of invisible others who will be evaluating mother and daughter's outfits. There's more translanguaging, which sees the juxtapositioning of signs for communicative effect. There's a resigned reconciliation from Parnit. Mother and daughter are keeping an eye on one another's face, not wanting the discussion to turn into hostility, managing the disagreement in terms of affiliation with translanguaging as a resource for achieving this. In the next extract, mother and daughter appear to reach agreement by drawing on others beyond the immediate speech act. Uh, a bit of a lot of fabric. I hate leopard print or felt animal print. I just hate it. I don't like it either. And why would you want a suit that looks like that? They're really irritating. In the moment he loves them. Serena loves it as well. I don't like her at all. I think, to be honest, when you compare Serena and Vivi Mamaji and stand them next together, so daughter and mother, and then me and you, you can tell that my taste has still gone on yours because you've influenced my taste. Like, her taste is more like that, and mine is more old taste. I like yours. Uh, oh, is it meant to be on? Isn't it our Asian people? They just park wherever they want to, don't they? <laughs> Look where he's parked. I want to go that way. Mm. When you signal that way, signal. He's reversing. Oh dear. Mum, signal to tell him that you're going that way. Well, I think he knows. I think he was waiting for the other guy to reverse. Oh dear. The best time to come. So in this extract, Parnit and her mother reach a resolution. This involves referring to Mumaji and Serena. We might say that the participants involved in this speech act and event are wider than the two interlocutors, Parnit and her mother. Mamaji and Serena serve as third, third parties who are decisive in Parnit and her mother's resolution of this mild conflict. Parnit and her mother can agree about their dislike of animal prints, and clothing is a sign indexing a social type here and part of their communicative repertoire. Parnit talks directly about being socialised into a particular social image here and aligns with her mother's influence, the old rather than the new. But there are careful distinctions being made by Parnit and her mother about who they are and who they are not, who they identify with and who they do not. Distinctions about age, femininity, Indianness, body image. There's a vast array of semiotic signs being used to make these careful distinctions. Use of accent, intonation, signs associated with different languages, tangible material signs of clothing indexing particular heritages. So Odia, when Parnit uses a, uh, an Indian accent, is a switch of voice. It's an artistic image of another, a kind of freshy Indian, perhaps. The interaction is, a mo is multifunctional, and we see examples of insults, persuasion, disagreements, commands, all performed multilingually. We're going to leave that mother and daughter conversation in the car, but we stay with them, and this time they're at home. Um, and um, this interaction, um, we see Parnit ask her mother for permission to meet up with her friends in the Easter holidays. And I just need to give you a little bit of context here, because the mock exams and the real exams in Britain happen in the summer term. So the Easter holiday is the time when you revise and get ready for those exams. So we'll just listen to the two of them again talking. Oh yeah, my friend, my friend was saying, you're doing Easter holidays for half a day, I don't know, but um, you see, um, well, they wanted to, especially if the, if the weather was nice, they wanted to meet up at a park that is near them Can and have park? like a, a picnic, um, my school friend. Okay. And I really like the idea, except their park is obviously round their houses, so obviously it's away from us. 
Because, you know, we have no parks here. Because they have a lot of green areas over there. No, not many parks here. No, there are plenty of parks here. No, there are. Yeah, but they're not going to come all the way over here, are they? <sighs> because there's like what? Summer, I bet you. No, Easter if it's nice -ish. Or meet up in the park. Definitely, but Easter holidays, pray you do not have a yeah, no. revised karma. Hana pura. Hmm. I don't know what pura means, but okay. Properly. Apa hone hi nahi thena, hana down earth ki koi karay thena. Hmm. और देख मैं देख दी सारे किन्ने पढ़े लिखे डॉक्टर किन्ना सुना बोल दे या है ना पढ़े लिखे पता लगता पढ़े लिखे या है ना एजुकेटेड पीपल है ना तो इस पढ़ी जाएंगे कि किन्ना थड़ी लाइफ जो रिस्पेक्ट होएगी थड़ी इन दिस इंटरेक्शन वी सी अ रिक्वेस्ट ओबीट इनडायरेक्टली मेड टू मीट अप विथ एंड गो आउट � into another negotiated, mild disagreement. Perhaps not quite so mild as for the outfit, I don't know. The request isn't granted. Instead of making her request directly, Pani represents the voice of her friend in indirect speech. What are you doing in the Easter holidays for half a day? In fact, Pani does not ask her mother a question, but advances her negotiating position through a series of statements which are suffused with hedges and mitigations. I don't know, but you see, especially if... Parnit's discourse is, discourse is sharply aware of the anticipated reaction of her mother. Bakhtin pointed out that the word is shaped not only by other words in the past and present, but also by the anticipated word of the other. Parnit's mother's response is not directly hostile, but seeks further information. Kere Park, Kere friends. Parnit pursues her argument, saying that she really likes the idea of going out to meet her friends. Her argument continues to be shaped by the anticipated voice of her mother, as Parnit says, except their park is obviously around their houses, so obviously it's away from here. Here again, except and the repetition of obviously act as mitigation strategies. For her mother, though, the sticking point is about the timing of the planned excursion. Samadovich, when Pani responds no, Easter, if it's nice-ish, nice -ish, there, there no longer appears to be room for negotiation. Her mother responds, Easter holidays, Pani, you do know. What Pani knows and agrees that she knows does not need to be said because it's been said before. However, her mother reminds her of her responsibilities. Pani picks up the key word here, pori, and contests it, while at the same time appe appearing to concede. I don't know what pora means, but okay. It's unlikely that Pani is complaining that she does not understand the Punjabi word pora. Rather, she is contesting her mother's view of what constitutes full or proper revision. Nevertheless, her mother translates the word and delivers a short lecture about the importance of education, through a range of linguistic resources, she argues that education leads to a respect through life. And we saw this also confirmed in the interview data. Uh, Parnit's mother said, education is so important. I think I helped them a lot, sat with them, did their homework with them and gave them ideas. In my head, there is a lot I'm quite gifted at, but I didn't get the opportunities in life. So I promised them that I would give them many opportunities in life. And from Parnit's interview, my mum was determined. She really wanted to help me to have a good education and all that. And so I was just as determined to at least try and get into the schools and see um, what I got. <coughs> In the everyday interaction between teenage daughter and her mother, discourses of aspiration and distinction become clearly visible. Also visible is the nature and extent of interest of investment in the educational game. In the everyday interactions between a teenage daughter and mother, discourses of femininity, social type, social class and education and distinction become clearly visible. Mother and daughter anticipate one another's voices. 
They create discursive spaces in which they are able to rehearse their doubts, their frustrations, their anxieties and aspirations. In these discursive spaces, compromises and concessions are agreed upon or disagreed about, negotiated and at times imposed. The audio recordings of family interactions in intimate spaces show social trajectories being directed and redirected. The repertoire of the two family members displays an awareness and familiarity with one another's discourses, a family lect, as Cynthia Gordon has called it. The interactions show a fast array of signs put to use in the performance of self as mother and daughters aspire in their ongoing relationship work to be and to become particular gendered, classed, race beings. Betsy Rhymes has referred to these linguistic resources as communicative repertoire, which she defines as the collection of ways individuals use language and literacy and other means of communication, gesture, dress, posture or accessories to function effectively in the multiple communities in which they participate. And she argues a focus on the resources deployed by individuals rather than attempting to generalise about the community of speakers is where we should start, looking closely and carefully at what this mother and daughter are doing rather than making generalisations about the Punjabi community. And in this, Rhymes shares um, similar arguments with uh, Blumert and Rampton who argue it is far more productive analytically to focus on the very variable ways in which linguistic features with identifiable social and cultural associations get clustered together whenever people communicate. And it seems to me, looking back at um, Del Himes's work um, over 40 years ago, he was making a similar point when he argued one starts with a social group and considers the entire organisation of linguistic means within it rather than start with one partial named organisation of linguistic means called a language. And this brings me to the last section of my talk today to try and connect what I've been look, talking about, the practices of what we see in our data to what, how that might be um, relevant to discussions of language teaching and learning and pedagogy. So, where does this Bilingual Speech Act analysis take us in terms of relevance to pedagogy and the teaching of appropriate language use in language classrooms? And here I consider the relevance of speech acts as teaching resources in the language classroom. But, um, again, let's return to um, original um, definitions and work by Del Himes um, of communicative competence. One of the pillars of communicative competence is this reference to um, appropriate language use. And I want to argue that my interpretation of Himes' appropriate language use is not about fixed norms, fixed um, boundaries and ideas of purity, but instead it's about fluidity, mobility and change. Um, he said, the acquisition of such competency is of course fed by social experience, needs and motives and issues in action that is itself a renewed source of motives, needs <coughs> and experience. And um, I find support here in Hornberger's interpretation when she argues this competence is by definition variable within individuals from event to event across individuals and across speech um, communities. And this has little in common with the way communicative competence is often understood and given to us actually as teacher educators and how we end up interpreting it in our classroom. So I end this presentation with a visit to Parneet's classroom. We, we met Hema and Narinda at the beginning of this talk and now we're going to go back to, to Hema and, and her classroom. Um, so Pani was taking classes uh, with, with Hema um, and what I want to do is look at how Hema handles this kind of notion of appropriate language use and the kinds of communicative competence she was um, 
teaching or dealing with in her classroom in, in Birmingham uh, in the teaching of Punjabi as a community language. So we're going to listen to two more data slides and then, um, then I'll make some final points. In this piece of classroom uh, interaction, um, Hema has uh, asked the students to provide um, vocabulary examples of, um, of uh, vowel sound e, a long e. So she's been teaching them this pronunciation of e, and she says, give me some um, examples of words that make that sound. Um. Next one. Leader. Which one? Leader. Leader. Leader, as in leader. 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 Leader means close. I haven't heard this word for ages. Where did you learn this word from? From your BB. Oh, my heart. Uh, Okay, have you heard it? Anybody put your hand up if you have heard this word before. Pavan, where did you hear this word from? Your bibi. Your bibi as well. Yeah, leader is a really traditional word for clothes. Okay, really old and traditional word. Uh, word. Leader. Now we say kapde. Leader. Okay, oh, good word. Well done. Yeah. Carry Okay, in many ways, this is an example of funds of knowledge. The teacher authenticates the children's knowledge um, and the knowledge of the home, the BB. She picks up examples of the home and she endorses them. But also on display here is a tension between signs. Lire indexes the traditional, but it also indexes rural, working class, non-standard Punjabi. Capre indexes standard Punjabi and the educated middle classes. These terms are not socially equal. Hema inter interrupts her pronunciation lesson to give the students a lesson on language in context and appropriate language use, and a lesson on language change. This was legitimate then, when your BB used it in the villages of the Punjab, but now it's not legitimate. What's legitimate now is Capre and standard Punjabi necessary for you to pass your GCSE exam, your, your language exam. So she introduces a critical element to her teaching. She says signs are indexing social hierarchies here and their use has social consequences. Hema links a discussion of appropriate language use to language change and social change. Communicative competence is fed by this experience of different contexts over periods of time and migration, transnational experiences. And in the next example, again we hear from Hema, the context of this is that her, one of her students have put their hands up and said, Miss, can we use an English word in our Punjabi writing? And this is what Hema says to them. would share one thing with you last week. I was doing a translation for somebody. Um, it was a Gurdwara, and it was a leaflet, a couple of lines, and I had to translate for some uh, Babaji, like Bazurg, yeah, elderly person. Um, and the word was community, community yeah? And I was uh, doing the translation, and I said, Samudai. Yeah, community means samudai. Couldn't understand. And then I tried to make this word more easier. No. And I was thinking, what shall I tell him? No. Then I said, shall I say the word community? I said community. He was fine. He did understand because some words, like they are so familiar, right? Because they are li the people, the people living with those words, right? They are just... He easily understood what I'm talking about. The community, I put the community can I see? Community can I see? I said, okay, I was, Uncle I was just doing one to word, word to word translation. Okay, some words, they are more easy to understand if you say them in English. Okay? So, using the standard Punjabi samudai 
caused misunderstanding. Keeping the languages separate did not enhance communication. A flexible and dynamic bilingualism did. Negotiating which term is appropriate between Babaji and Hema is possible because of their shared social histories and experiences. Hema performs a positive model of translanguaging for her students, which endorses the use of different signs across language boundaries. She encourages the development of bilingual competence, which isn't allowed in many other institutional settings. She provides a local model of bilingualism for students to aspire to. Hema puts into practice what Hornberger and Garcia have been arguing for many years. Bio multilinguals' learning is maximised when they are allowed and enabled to draw from across all of their existing language skills in two plus languages, rather than being constrained and inhibited from doing so by monolingual instructional assumptions and practices. And from Ophelia Garcia, in the 21st century, we are aware of the linguistic complexity of the world in which monolingual schooling seems utterly inappropriate. Language differences are a resource and bilingual education in all its complexity and forms seems to be the only way to educate the world uh, as the world moves forward. So in our work, my work with Adrian Blackledge, we've been arguing beyond which language is in use, we can ask what signs are in use and action and what do these signs point to? What are the tensions and conflicts among those signs? How are voices represented in them? And we're arguing that no, new forms of multilingualism emerge that defy dominant understandings of multilingualism as the ordered deployment of different languages. And we've seen examples, I think, um, I've tried to show as pink and sparkly versus leopard and animal prints pointing to particular femininities and not others. These are competing ideologies. There's tensions and conflicts between Lire and Capre, Samudai and community. And we've also heard from many different voices. Of course, we've heard from Parnit and her mother, from Hema and Narinda, but we've also heard from Parnit's friends, family, relatives, Bibi, Mamaji, Serena, voices from the Gudwara and from the community, all involved in the relationship work between mother and daughter, all projecting different social positionings. And um, Delheimza says, it's a truism that one frequently ignored in research that how something is said is part of what is said. For members of the community, mastery of ways of speaking is a prerequisite to personal uh, expression. So it's not just the referential, it's not just the content, and, and, or as Bakhtin said, it, it's not just the thematic content, it's about the echoes of, of these signs, um, both past, present and future. This language is operating in many different functions here. And um, Nancy mentioned the book uh, that's coming out, and indeed um, Betsy Rhymes does have a, an article in it, and, and um, does, so does uh, Holly Link and uh, uh, Sansom Worth um, also. So, um, uh, in, in this um, uh, extract from, from uh, Rhymes' article, I, I just love the way this is said, and I, I want to read it out. Aesthetically, a focus on code often leads to a waste of the brilliance of communication that heteroglossia affords. Who wants to speak pure English or pure French or pure African-American English? Not only are those categories fictions, they are not very expressive. In many contexts, the expressive power of these repertoire elements lie in their ability to be mixed and savoured in new ways and combinations, and part of the joy in communicating is being able to notice the nuances of someone's unique repertoire and to savour their robust, expressive possibilities. So if you want to read more, buy the book when it comes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to make connections um, from new faculty to old faculty, to previous faculty, um, I return to Nessa Wolfson's work because, again, uh, I think she had great hindsight and force, sorry, great foresight to, to uh, anticipate uh, some of these discussions and debates which were coming our way. She says, the point is very simply that people do not speak 
in a social or situational vacuum. They speak in specific places on specific occasions about specific topics and to specific others. Participants have a range of styles appropriate in the, uh, to the speech event. And in some, then, I suggest that there is no such independent entity as casual or natural speech and that we substitute, substitute instead the term appropriate speech and investigate it not specifically in experimental situations such as interviews, but whenever it occurs. And I think that what Nessa Walson is arguing here is that what appropriate speech means is speech that's happening in context. And for that reason, it's, it's an important term uh, still. But also, from those last two points, there are methodological um, elements that I just want to comment on. Um, she argued that we should be looking at speech as it happens amongst our friends in our, excuse me, in our, in our various contexts. Um, and, and I think also she, this, this last point, which is very interesting for us, and we haven't written about it yet, but we really want to, the tape recorder as a participant in the conversation. We're very interested in the performative element of, of wearing those, um, those digital um, audio recording devices, which of course uh, Nessa had no idea that, it, uh, you know, that from the, the digital age uh, was going to make it so easy to record in the way that we're able to record these days. Um, so, um, let me just correct uh, myself here. Um, so, going back to the original assignment I did for Nessa on the Speaking Naturally book, I think I would stand up for my arguments that teachers of language can't be absolute arbitrators, arbitrators of appropriate language use. In fact, it's a rather dangerous role for a teacher to have. As Walson suggests in these quotes, appropriate language use requires knowledge of participants, their relationships, their histories, and their imagined futures. Being a native speaker teacher doesn't qualify you to do that. But my teacher, Dr. No Dr. Walson, was right. We have to know about theory and findings from empirical scholarship in order to inform our teaching. Recent work in multilingualism has important implications for teacher development in all domains of language teaching, and there are some very exciting ideas out there. Communicative competence needs to be free of static views of language use and social experience. We need to highlight variability, mobility, and change, just as Heinz did. We need a new aesthetic in which we make connections to the poetry of lives outside the classroom to those inside the classroom. And I end this presentation as I started with a compliment exchange. I take a risk here because ending in this way doesn't fit the genre. It's not appropriate. <laughs> but I want to pay a compliment to my other teacher here, Nancy Hornberger. Nice blouse, Nancy. No, 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 no. <laughs> not, not an appearance compliment, but an achievement one. Nancy, you're an inspirational teacher, scholar, supervisor, mentor, colleague and friend, and your scholarship, leadership, sincerity and humility sets an example for us all. As you sit in the audience, you don't have the floor to accept, refuse or negotiate the <laughs> but I know that many will share my view. Well, why end in this way? Well, for one thing, I know that Nessa would approve. <laughs> From these scribbles on the same assignment I started this talk with, Nessa has written in response to my description of complement functions, yes, also, there is nothing wrong with creating goodwill. And that's how I remember my whole time at Penn. I'm deeply grateful for the encouragement, belief and goodwill of all my teachers. Thank you. <laughs>
Yes. Been doing quite, or and others have been doing uh, quite interesting work on legitimacy and authenticity, which kind of add another layer, uh, I think, perhaps, um, to how we might deal with appropriate. Um, certainly, yeah, and, and I, I, I think it's, I do think it's a real issue for teachers when they when they get asked these questions: is it appropriate or not? And I never want to be this, you know, the the person who decides whether something is appropriate or not. So I, I and, and I don't, well, I'm not sure whether, whether that's exactly what um, Nessa Wilson was saying, but I, I do think, yeah, with widening the context and thinking about the histories and the aspirations and, and then bringing in other ideas about um, authenticity and legitimacy, we can get away from the kind of, our, you know, these kind of having all the power to say this is right or this is wrong. That, that's clearly dangerous <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I think it's time to move on from that. So, which I guess, yeah, what I've been trying to, to think about from that. Let's see. I just, just to add on to Anne's question, and I think that's a really interesting slide that you have about what it is that is one possible way of looking Yes. So a meta commentary, which again is, is what your work is about. No, but it's an important it's an important point. Yes, yeah, so, uh, opportunities for meta commentary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and Capre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's not only, there, it seems to me there's, like, I, I kind of saw a couple of different things going on there. Uh, there was, on the one hand, that a commentary on, uh, you know, alternate, what, alternate ways of saying the same thing, which is, you know, what we call registers, mm -hmm. right, uh, going on, revealed a lot about what participants defined as appropriate, but there's also, it seems to me, maybe, another dimension to what was happening in that transcript Mm, yes, uh, and uh, in other words, the teacher was, in a sense, I mean, coming, skirting dangerously close to something that uh, is not appropriate, <laughs> which is uh, uh, corrected to people's grandparents. Mm. <laughs> Recognizably, not to essentialize, but 
were recognizably possibly English, sort of well done. Right? Teacher, it was closing off uh, the episode with a kind of compliment. Yes. But a compliment that also achieves uh, we're going to move on from this topic now to the teacher's kind of doing topic control. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. No, no, that's very interesting. I mean, it's great when the discussion starts, it takes off without me being here. So. <laughs> no, no, I really, no, I really mean that. No, I mean, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you for your talk. Uh, and I have a policy and pedagogy question I'd love your feedback on. When I was a teacher, like in the 1990s, when scholars and t I think teachers alike were more prone to essentializing language, one of the advantages was, like, I taught in a school where there were actually four different bilingual programs um, in Spanish, Tagalog, and Cambodian, and one other language I can't remember right now. Subsequently, like, all those, all those bilingual programs have been dismantled, right? And now I'm finding, you know, kind of with this kind of postmodern or post structuralist turn, there are more regular classroom teachers who are evaluating, um, you know, translanguaging and um, the hybridity or creolization of language practices, but you know there, there are no more bilingual programs, and you know some of my colleagues in bilingual education, you know, argue for the focus on language as opposed to like the group or the family, because they believe if you don't really explicitly teach the language, you know, then the language deemed superior by the state will eventually kind of prevail at least over generations. So I just wonder, any of your thoughts um, regarding that, if that question makes sense. Okay, well, the first thing to say is that obviously I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm giving a talk about uh, language use in, in Birmingham in complementary schools. So I, I think it's really important, although on the one hand I want to say the arguments we're making about translanguaging or I'm making about translanguaging, I think are very important, particularly in, in other kind of EFL, ESL contexts as we kind of dismantle the whole thing about L1 and L2 and the kind of status of the native speaker. I'm not sure that I can, or I would want to, generalize across to some of, you know, any, any educational context. So I, and the other thing is, you know, in the UK, we do not have a tradition of any kind of bilingual education, possibly in Wales, well, no, there, there is some work going on in Wales, but in England, you know, we just don't have that. So I, you know, I don't mean to be passing the buck, but I think it's the kind of, uh, it would be better coming from other US academics here to comment on that, because it's, it's not a context that, this research really, I think, comments directly on, but certainly in terms of my own experience, either as a teacher or as an academic, that I've really been involved in. I mean, I, I do think, though, having said that, that, that um, the kind of strict demarcation between one language here and one language there in the kind of timetabling in bilingual programs, from what I know about work in the United States, kind of flies in the face of of what people like Ophelia and Nancy have been arguing, that if you keep that so strict, you just, you, you're doing probably quite a fair amount of harm to the young people who then aren't able to draw on their resources. Having said that, of course there are arguments here about the status of languages in relation to one another, about the importance of keeping those languages on the timetable, making sure there are bilingual programs and they are sustained. But, you know, I... I um, I, uh, perhaps others would like to comment on, on that. Perhaps, perhaps you would like to comment no, on that. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Well, just, I, I guess I could just say that, um, for one thing, the context in which she's working is a complementary school that is about teaching the other language, the non-English language. So it isn't that, and in the same way, the fact that the bilingual programs in California have been disbanded is not because academics have been talking about the end of language, you know, it's because <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole other set of political, of course, uh, yeah. you know, currents that are creating that. So I, I don't think they're necessarily oppositional to think about having bilingual programs in which translanguaging still goes on. You know, I don't think it has to be an either or. So, um, I'm going to I'm still stuff that appropriate, I think. Um, in the US context, I think people take 
pick up appropriate to mean that you teach students to code switch, right? That mm -hmm. you teach them, and in one context you speak in a certain way, and in another context you speak in another way. Um, others have criticized that because they argue that it's coming from a very white and black perspective, and in some ways it's perpetuating this politics of respectability as long as we act like white middle class people, that everything else will be okay. The problem is that I don't know what the theory of change is for that. And I think you're talking about something different than that, so I'm wondering how you see your work as different than advocating code switching in the traditional sense. Yeah, well, I, I'm certainly, I mean, um, well, I, I think along with Ophelia Garcia, I, I would argue that um, at times code switching does have a place in the kind of analysis we do, and it, and it is useful to, to, to look at. Yeah I, I, yeah, I know that. I, I watch it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, what. Well, I, I think there are different, I'm not sure, I, I think there are different questions that you, you've asked me. So, so there's a kind of difference between translanguaging and, and code switching, I think. So translanguaging, um, as, as Ophelia argues, and I'm sure you're very aware of the arguments, it's about what the, what the speaker is doing with their linguistic resources, it's about the, the social practice rather than, you know, with a focus on the code. It's also kind of recognising real life experience and, and where we are. Um, so... Um, that's different perhaps from the appropriateness question. I mean, I, my, my discussion of appropriateness really is about, comes from a kind of much more of an EFL context um, where, yeah, where, where the, um, the argument is that you kind of are, I think, very much teaching a kind of middle class uh, white perspective on, on what is allowed when, you know, when you're using English. And um, so again, it's a slightly different context, I think, from, but, but so, so how does it get used, this notion of appropriateness then in the... I mean, from my experience, it's used to say in certain contexts you should speak in certain ways. It's okay to use your own language right. practices at home, but in right. school oh, okay. you speak in a school way. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I find that somewhat funny. Yeah. But, and, and, and in fact, in our work too, I mean, one of the things in complementary schools that we've looked at is that these two ideologies are very much simultaneous in, in play. So, of course, you have the teachers arguing for a, a separate bilingualism, that this language has no place here, you keep that language there, while, of course, in practice, you, you, you hear that. But that, I wasn't using appropriateness in that way. I, I, that's very interesting and helpful to me, because I hadn't really thought of, about appropriateness in that kind of context. It was more about kind of cultural rules that, you know, you have the right to compliment that person in this way and, and this is what you should do if, or if it happens. Actually, I'm sure we've moved on from, from that uh, pedagogy, but, what, but still the ideology of the native speaker is still, you know, very much there. Despite attempts by academics to deconstruct it over and over again, it's still a very, very powerful discourse and, and I think in and, and one of the things I want to argue is that in these complementary schools in these kind of marginalized schools um, which are often considered as you know having nothing to do with the whole kind of business and industry of EFL we've got something to learn and, and it's about the diversity actually of our multilingual cities and, and so from these contexts I think there are pedagogic lessons to be at least thought about in terms of EFL and, and ESL. Yeah. Think, oh, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Also, thank you very much for your great okay. talk. I've gotten there a little late, so I didn't catch the first part. But I, was, I would like to know if you could just offer us a little more, well, offer me, a little more um, description of your definition of multi-directionality. You know, the psychologists and sociologists have a very person-oriented way of thinking about multi-directionality, of going between people. And what you talked about, what I thought I heard, was a much more intricate and um, interwoven way of thinking about multi-directionality. Multi so I was just wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the ways in which it took place in the work, multi-directionality. Okay, I think I used it in. Thank you. I think I think I tried to use it in well. two ways. In yeah. fact, um, particularly with the daughter. And the yeah, um, I used it in two ways. The first way I think I, I used it was in terms of politeness theory and face. 
So, so the idea that, um, that mother and daughters were looking after this, this thing of this concept called positive face and um, negative face. So they were, doing, they were doing both. They weren't just like kind of doing um, solidarity stuff. They were also doing stuff about not imposing on one another. And the reason they were, they were doing that is because they had a, uh, because, because they're mother and daughter, because they have a close relationship and because they, they, they have an eye on the future um, and the kind of relationship they imagine for themselves. So I meant multidirectionality in terms of politeness theory and face work. But I also think I meant it in terms of past, present, and future, um, which again is about, well, Stanton Wortham has, has talked a lot about, you know, the kind of um, dangers of just looking at the speech act to the present rather than thinking about everything that's in, informing it in terms of what's gone before, but also imagining what is in the future. And, and I mean, I'm sure many of us here have kind of been in, in these kind of intro. I have a 14 year, I have a 15 year old daughter. She's just turned. So I, I really see myself in, in this. And I, you know, I, it's personal. It really is personal. Yeah. And so you kind of, you know, you, what, what is happening there? There's, there's so much careful work going on about not just in the moment, but the way you want your relationship to be with your, with your daughter in the future. And so that multidirectionality is both about, yeah, the theory of face. Yeah. All the things that came before, all the things that are going on right there, and all the things that one could project. Yes. Future, yeah. But but it is actually the first time I've used it, so it's it's a helpful question to me because it will make me think more about oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm holding up. <laughs> All right. So, but we, we also want to not exhaust no, I'm ourselves. Okay, I'm okay. I'm So yeah. I'll say one, one or two more questions. Yes. Thank you. It's a really, it's a wonderful question. I, I, I suppose in in the context that um, from the research that I've presented, obviously these young people, their their first language is, is English, and um, and in fact there's a lot of, I mean, the complement. The, the, so they can't, in terms of learning Punjabi or learning Gujarati or, or the languages they they um, they their heritages or their histories are in. They, the, this is really the only place that um, they can go in, in terms of institutional terms to, to learn um, Punjabi or, or, or the, the various languages. So the schools are important institutions to try and really say that multilingualism is an asset in the UK at least. In the mainstream, in the, in the secondary schools, there really isn't an opportunity to, to learn and maintain these community languages. So these schools do a job, in, uh, well, have an important job in, I don't know if they raise the status of the language, but for, for the young people themselves, they provide an institutional context which endorses their multilingualism and bilingualism. There are very few institutional spaces in England where that can happen. So in terms of nationally, so much more could be done. 
but I would say these schools are very important institutions for raising the institutional profile of community languages and therefore in a very, very small way perhaps the status of them. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's rather gloomy in, in some ways, but, yeah. Yes, yes, oh yes, they can do. Um, but these, these uh, schools, um, we call them complement, one of the reasons we call them complementary schools rather than supplementary schools is that we want to suggest that in, in many ways they're in line with the state education system in the sense that they want the kids to pass examinations and, and do well. And of course that's what parents want for their kids too. I don't think there's a conflict. In fact, in many ways, what you would see is that the young people might struggle with some of these notions of flexible bilingualism. They want to pass the exam. They want to know what's right and what's wrong, and they, and they want to pass the exam. So, um, the, yeah, so, so I don't think there's a conflict. Because, calling them community languages or community language schools is is a British terminology that's kind of in common use for talking about the teaching of, of these languages, unlike French, German and Spanish, which are the subjects which are taught in mainstream. Of course, just like Ophelia Garcia talked about last year, there are, you know, these are contested terms about heritage, community and, and other terms. But um, yeah, in terms of the, um, the schooling, the kids can take the exam or, or not take the exam. I, I kind of went off the question a bit, but did I, did I no, answer I'm that? I'm just interested in whether they, you know, we're talking about them you know, having access to these two languages, but then I was interested in the fact that they did take exams and then how that just fitted into how the schools see themselves and the teachers see themselves and their role um, in what they're doing. Yeah, so what happens is the, the, the schools, um, the, the kids take their exams, they take them in the mainstream, even though the mainstream hasn't been involved in teaching them. The mainstream schools, the state schools, get the credit for the exams, but the complementary schools do the work for it. Um, and, yeah, there's that kind of separation. And that's why, of course, many people argue that the community languages should be taught in, in the mainstream too. Um, and, and, um, in this country, the... Um Association of Chinese Mother Tongue Schools worked really hard to get recognition for the Chinese AP mm -hmm. and that happened only in the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. It's a big achievement to have that kind of mutual mm -hmm. recognition. Mm -hmm. But you're right, the state is benefiting from the grassroots effort of the community. And, and I have, but in, but it's, it's not an easy, because the complementary schools have more freedom to manage their curriculum that if they were in the state sector, they wouldn't have quite so much freedom. And there are good and bad things about that too, right? I mean, as you, I'm sure you're aware. There's a question I've got. Oh, whether the parents are involved in any kind of, um, I know in one of the schools, or maybe two of the schools, the parents were involved in some administrative and volunteer work, but are the parents or the home community and the home environment at all, do they contribute to the, the way that the schools run, or do the schools try to draw a distinction between, for example, with um, Celeri and Bengali, do they draw a distinction where, like, no, we are the authority, and then at home you can um, have your, your home language? Well, it's, it's, it's obviously my answer is it's mixed, right? So that, um, so generally, um, I, well, first thing is that the, the mainstream schools where we, sh we show this, they, they often kind of, they dream of the kind of relationship that complementary schools often have with their parents in the, fact, in the sense that the parents come along, they're part of assemblies and things. And often the, the parents can be teachers and 
Uh, yeah, so, but on the other hand, I would say that there's still a discourse in the school of, oh, the parents don't speak enough of the community language at home, kind of thing. So, you know, kind of complaining about what the parents should do, um, should do more of. Um, they, it's mixed. It, it varies from one school to another. It also varies by resource. I would say the Gujarati, Punjabi and Chinese schools have a lot more resources and money and wealth than the Bengali and the Turkish schools. So there are differences really um, in terms of what's possible for the schools to organize, including resources like computers and, you know, I mean, so, so they, they vary quite a lot. Um, yeah. One last comment? Uh, okay, well, uh, just a quick comment, and then, and then you've anticipated my question, that's why I kind of calmed down with your last comment, or you kind of already answered it. But one, one, one quick observation is, is, is that, and this will be a little non part to sell this audience uh, on the idea that terminology is important and reveals <laughs> things of social significance, but I'm struck by the, the terminology of complementary education, because it reminds me a little bit of complementary medicine, mm. which is sort of you're saying, you know, Western medicine mm. is legitimate, but this is additionally also maybe legitimate. And then in a more specific sense, the community, the term community, I'm telling you something you know well, the term community has a, yeah. like a special set of connotations That's in, true. The, in, the, in the context of the UK, where if a community has a demonstrable presence, then they have the right to receive provision. Mm. If you see what I mean, that's a totally different model than the way America mm. works. But here is here's here my natural question. Is, is, is in many places, heritage language education serves possibly a, a, a more privileged stratum mm. of the society uh, of, of speakers of the language and you just talked about the degree of parent involvement, the way or these mainstream schools are envious of having mm -hmm. that level of parent involvement. I just wonder if you found, uh, well, could you continue a little bit your description of the class dimensions? I mean, you just said Punjabi uh, speakers are better served by these things than Bengali and Turkish. Do you have any further? Yeah, uh, there are huge differences in in the wealth of the different uh, communities, yeah. I'm trying to avoid the word, parent groups and people who, who support um, these organizations. Um, uh, but I wanted to also, um, so, so, so and, and with that, I think probably to go back to your question, also confidence in about getting involved. And, and also, you know, um, uh, confidence, I think, also in terms of what varieties and standards different um, schools decide to teach. So, for example, Silet in the Bengali school, Sileti is the language of the, the children and the parents, but they teach standard Bengali, and, and there's a real tension there um, about what that means. Um, and, and, and actually in the Chinese schools too, it's very interesting because a shift from Cantonese to Mandarin and what, what those different varieties mean. Um, the Punjabi complementary schools have been very interesting to us because there are, they, the, the young people, I haven't really talked today very much about um, social class and, and education, but the Punjabi schools um, education incredibly, a very strong discourse running through our participants and, and the attendance in private schools in the UK, a kind of, of elite bilingualism, a confidence about who they are and what they want and um, we have very interesting recordings of uh, interactions in family homes which are very much about aspirations of becoming doctors, lawyers, you know, and not others and I haven't really talked about that today but all of that is is important in our data and, and there, but, yeah. Now you're really finished. Oh, okay. <laughs>